You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Today we are in Fucecchio. <laughs> I'm on top of the San Baronto climb. They've got a howling tailwind as they come over the top here. The leaders have just gone through. Uh, Giulio Ciccone in the blue King of the Mountains jersey, I think just about took the points at the top there. And uh, the rest of the breakaway, or what's left of the breakaway, came over just behind him. And now the wait for the bunch but they are going to be flying around this corner here. I think this is them. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that is rapid. And it looks like the bunch has split, actually. I think I saw all the key jerseys in there. I saw Simon Yates on the near side. But they are really going quickly over the top there, helped by the tailwind and the fact that the road is going back downwards again. So they've got around about 30 kilometres, I think, 28 kilometres to the finish. And uh, I would say that given the gap, the breakaway are not going to stay away and we'll probably have a sprint finish on the line. It's anyone's guess who takes that. As I said yesterday, or in our preview rather, Viv Viviani versus Gaviria versus Ackerman possibly, versus Caleb Ewan, versus Arno Demar versus some wild cards mixing it in the sprint, no doubt. Uh, but I suppose better get in the car and go and hook up with the other two. Where were you, Lionel? I was on the top of the San Baranto climb, the final climb of the day, watching the bunch come over the top and using the tailwind to reel in the brake as they rattled into the finish in Fuscecchio. Well, um, you sounded doubtful about whether Ackerman would be a, a contender there. I did. I said, yeah, Ackerman would possibly be involved in the sprint. A, a bit daft in hindsight because he won it very convincingly, really. It was, a, well, it was an impressive win. First Grand Tour for the German champion. And he's, uh, he's won at the first opportunity, hasn't he? Because he wasn't I mean, going to win the... He's a sprinter saying he's going to be involved. He'll probably be involved in the sprint. But like saying... You're going to be involved in the buffet. I mean, it's a fairly <laughs> short bet, isn't there? <laughs> True, and there is a kind of big five of sprinters in this race, isn't there? And they all finished in the top five, and Ackerman's certainly in that mix. But, you know, first Grand Tour shouldn't take for granted that someone, even with good results um, in their locker, shouldn't take for granted that they can just reel off a win like that. It sometimes takes people several days to get into the swing of things. So I, I personally thought that Gaviria or Ewan would win today. But they were they were second and third. Napalm, you were on the top of the San Baronto, a, a mythical or um, very famous Tuscan cycling climb. We're overlooking another one, the other Tuscan climb par excellence. What is it? That one over there. Um, I don't know. Pointing, You're going to have to tell me. Pointing off over these rolling hills, um, Monte Serra. Ah. Where everyone who's anyone um, in cycling is trained pretty much at some point. It's what we're just above Vinci where tomorrow's stage starts and it is wild isn't it it's really you can probably hear the, the wind you can hear Daniel's newspaper collection blowing in the breeze here um, what have we got coming up tonight we've got Caleb Ewan who was third looked really good for the win about 200 metres out but he was third Jens Zemke who's the sports director of Borhans grow up we've got Matt White Matt Shandry Giro podcast, Giro favourites, <laughs> making a first appearance. Uh, but have we got the tail of the tapper first, please, Lionel? We have stage two, Bologna to Fuscecchio, 205 kilometres. Uh, there was some debate about whether the break would succeed or whether it would be a sprint. We saw a sprint. I just said there that um, Ewan and Gaviria were second and third. They actually weren't. They were third and fourth because the man just behind Pascal Ackerman, the German champion, was the Italian champion, Elia Viviani. Demar, Arno Demar of uh, Group Armour FDJ was fifth. Um, it's going to be really interesting in the first 10 days uh, with several sprint opportunities to see what the tally is because now Ackerman's got one. Will he go on a roll or um, will Viviani, Ewan, Gaviria or Damar, you know, level it up 
uh, in the next couple of days. Anyway, there was the first break of the race, which included Giulio Ciccone of Trek Segafredo and his teammate Will Clark, Francois Bidar of AG2R, Marco Fraporti of Androni, Mirko Maestri of Bardiani, Vukas Ocean of CCC, Sean Bennett of EF Education First and Damiano Chima of Nippo Vini Fantini. And they got a pretty decent lead. They got away in the heavy rain as the race left Bologna. And as you say, Rich, it was windy and wet uh, a lot of the day, but it did brighten up towards the end. Um, the wind didn't drop, though. Um, the brake were still away, or the, a few of the riders from the brake were still away as they went over the last climb, but they were caught somewhere between 10 and 5 kilometres to go because that's when my Eurosport player lost signal um, and when I got it back everyone was all together and then uh, well we knew that Giacomo Nizzolo was ruled out of the sprint because he had a puncture uh, Belletti of Androni who would have been hoping to get involved as well he had a mechanical problem in the final 2 kilometres and then there was that crash on the final corner I don't know too much about who was involved in that but a few people went down on the right hand side of the road and then well, it looked to me like Ackerman came from the wheels and really sort of, you know, put his mark on the, the the race by winning in quite convincing style. Impressive stuff from Pascal Ackerman. It looked to me like a, a pretty straightforward drag race in the sense it was a pretty clean sprint. Um, most of the, the sprinters got a decent lead out, so... Um, Ackerman looks so he might be the, the quickest in the race at the moment. And the thing is that the big story about Bora Hansgrohe was leaving Sam Bennett out of um, the Giro d'Italia where he of course won three stages last year. He's not, not likely to do the Tour de France either. Uh, so he's a good enough sprinter to guarantee a win somewhere along the line you would have thought but as you said Daniel Ackerman being the German rider the German champion um, long term contract the long term contract the longer term bet um, and Sam Bennett's not even on the start list for the Tour of California because that race is uh, all about Peter Sagan for Bora Hansgrohe. They're going to sell him to Katusha? That's a, that's a rumour going around that Sam Bennett might go to Katusha mid-season. In, yeah, in time for the Tour, who knows? Well, yeah, because obviously we didn't cover the news of Marcel Kittel's sabbatical retirement. Not quite sure at the moment how to interpret that, but he is, well, he's he's not going to be riding for Katusha at the Tour de France. He's uh, cancelled his contract by mutual consent, as they say in football anyway. So you're right, maybe Maybe there is conscious a uncoupling. Conscious There's uncoupling, yeah. So there, Katusha probably need a sprinter of that level. Bennett might be available. Who knows? Maybe a deal could be done. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Run. Uh, Rafa have been publishing their roadmap looking at some of the issues, problems, challenges facing cycling in recent weeks. Um, the final two chapters are going up on Velo News quite soon. There have been eight chapters so far. You can also read that at rafa.cc. Lots of interesting stuff to mull over. We've been reading it and um, we're going to be talking about that in when we've got time uh, because obviously the Giro's on at the moment. But there's a lot in there to chew over. So check it out at velonews.com or rafa.cc. A reminder too that we will be awarding the Peddler de Charme t-shirt throughout the uh, Giro. Coveted Peddler, Peddler de Charme t-shirt. The first one will go at the end of this week. So we'll be looking for nominations for your Peddler de Charme. Does Jakob Moretzko qualify for allegedly uh, eating a Big Mac? Well, um, was he eating one no, or was he, he was just in McDonald's? Not. He was definitely not. Um, there's been some, we always seem to mention beef. And um, we always seem to make <laughs> mention some, make some lame. In this case, no beef, in we, fact. Well, no beef, apparently, because Chiro saw Moretzko in McDonald's, but there was, there's no suggestion, or there's no suggestion from Chiro that he was tucking into a Happy Meal. Um, <laughs> but the La Gazzetta dello Sport this morning, Chiro was not the writer in question, but they did say that, well, I think... Potentially the source, weren't, though. Weren't, yeah, in, the, the, yeah, the, but, the source. The source. Um, so I think this information was passed on to someone else at La Gazzetta, and they were sort of weighing up the contenders for today's sprint finish. And they said, "Well, oh, you can kind of forget about Moretzko. He's a, you know, he's a bloke who thinks it's okay to, you know, <laughs> go to the drive-through half I mean, an hour he, before his time he, trial." He, he was. And I don't think he, he was, was very one happy. of the last finishers in the time trial. So, um, you know, that's you expect the last few guys to have all stuffed down at McDonald's. And McDonald's was right beside the, the, mm. the paddock. So tempting, tempting people. 
Anyway, it's, it's a crime anyway eating McDonald's in Italy, isn't it? In Bologna, of all places. Sweet. Yeah, the, ca- the the capital of food in uh, in Italy, and McDonald's. Oh, do they do a Bolognese burger? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> Listen, at the finish, uh, while Lionel was uh, was trying to find our, our hotel, Daniel and I were were among the buses speaking to riders and so on. And I spoke to Caleb Ewan, who was third after a very very good lead out from his team, Lotus Sudal. They looked like they'd really nailed that, and uh, it just m- maybe meant that Ewan went a little bit too early, and he was overtaken by Viviani uh, and Ackerman. Of course, I spoke to Ackerman's DS Jens Zemka. Um, Let's hear first from Caleb Ewan and then from Jens Zemka. Third, third in the end there, what were your what were your thoughts? I mean, you had a very, very good lead out. It looked like the team did a great job in the in the closing stages. Yeah, to be honest, I really, I can't fault them at all. They gave me a, yeah, a perfect lead out. And yeah, to be honest, obviously I'm disappointed that I couldn't win after that. Um, so yeah, maybe I think I was dying a little bit in the last 50 metres. Uh, after today's stage, you know, any stage with 2,500 metres climbing is is going to be pretty tough so uh yeah maybe i felt that a little bit in the end and maybe i just need to start my sprints a bit later but other than that the the guys did a perfect job so i can't fault them yeah i mean that's maybe the the one thing that you were the guy that hit the front first and and the others sort of came came from behind maybe just left it a little bit went a, a little bit too early yeah yeah when when you've got this this caliber of sprinter here if you're going to lead out the sprint then you you really have to nail it and you really need to have it so you're yeah, you've got max power all the way to the line. And like I said, I just think maybe I was dying a little bit in the last 50 metres and, and that was enough for Hackerman and, and Viviani to just come around. But yeah, other than that, I think uh, I can take a lot of positives out of today. The, the team works so well together and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next few stages. Well, a lot more opportunities for you guys. Yeah, you know, I think there's going to be another maybe five five opportunities or six opportunities. So. Um, yeah, this gives me a lot of confidence going to those the team working so well together. So I'm looking forward to it. First day then. I mean, you must be you must be delighted. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was a, a big success two years ago with Pesty. It was last year with with Sam. Now we are here with Akas. So Giro seems to be good for us. <laughs> it was, I mean, obviously uh, an important stage for sprinters, and we saw UAE take it on really early. Um, and then Bora Hansgrove were very prominent uh, at a certain point in the race as well. What was the, the plan? Were you worried about these climbs today and, and how, how Ackerman coped with those? Or you know, were you sort of waiting to see how he was, was after the climbs before you really committed? Yeah, I mean, um, we were lucky with a strategy in Catalonia where we also said, hey, boys, we right now in the front, yeah, because we have one of the fastest sprinters and we want to stay out of the trouble. And this worked again or um, yeah if, if it's not working then everybody's saying yeah why do you work so much in the front but in this case yeah it worked out and then you you did everything right and on paper I mean would you have put him as a, a potential winner today I, I, I guess he would but it's a very strong field of sprinters are you surprised to see him beat the likes of Viviani and Gaviria yeah but um, these names that you mentioned Viviani Gaviria also Caleb yeah Demar, they come with a complete lead out train and we have a young challenger so he is one of the sprinters of the of the new generation and he showed in relative smaller races that he is capable to beat them and we give him the trust and we have a good spirit and good atmosphere and it was a goal to win a stage with him that it's directly the first one that's amazing a bit of pressure on him as well because there's been a, a, you know some talk about whether Sam Bennett should have come to Giro having won so many stages last year did he do you think feel feel pressure or or has he been able to really just focus on himself yeah I think also he likes this positive pressure yeah <laughs> and I mean with with Sam Bennett of course it's a very tough decision uh, but yeah we also have to give him the, the possibility to ride a, a court tour and to compete on this level and yeah, we know it. Do you know what I noticed, Rich, at the buses this afternoon? Usually, after a sprint finish in a Grand Tour, you see a lot of angst. You see a lot of frustration. A lot of sort of bikes being slammed down on the side of team buses. I didn't see any of that today. And I think, possibly, that's got something to do with the fact that the sprinters know they're going to have a lot of opportunities um, Although, in this race. Although, Viviani is, is a very sort of affable fellow, isn't he? But he doesn't. He really doesn't like losing, and it must be difficult in that team to kind of quick step because there's such an expectation. I mean, anything other than a win is a is a is a failure there. And 
he was he was really not happy. I, I mean, he, he he was annoyed, uh, and he was making quite a play of you know riding extremely fast through the paddock and past people and journalists who might get in his way. He went very sort of brushed them aside, so um, he didn't look very happy. But I mean, you know, as I say, second place for him is is a failure. You know, he he's here to win in his snazzy new Italian Champions jersey. But sure just on are. the on the sprints, how many more sprints do you think we've got? Uh, by my reckoning, tomorrow, stage five, which is to Terracina, stage eight to Pesaro, and then the two stages after the time trial, after the rest day, which are completely flat. I mean, they're like billiard table flat, stage 10 and 11. So, you know, it's not even a particularly tense game of musical chairs yet, is it? Everyone's got still got a good chance to win one. It's when that tension comes in, when suddenly there's, when there's five a, sprinters and yeah. only three left to and win. A, or when a sort of pecking order is established, when mm. somebody's better than the others and it falls upon their team to control. And what you saw today was, uh, you know, we, we were speaking, I think, Daniel, as we watched the finish, and just noticing or noting how little De Kuhn and Quickstep had seemed to do in terms of keeping the race together. UAE were very active very early on for Gaviria, and Bora Hansgrohe really came to the fore much later on. As we heard me asking Jens Emke there, that was maybe there was some uncertainty over how Ackerman would cope with the climbs, um, and UAE perhaps looked at Gaviria as maybe one of the stronger kind of sprinter climbers who, uh, through their efforts, might there might be uh, you know one or, one or two other sprinters who may have been el- eliminated. They weren't. Um, so that it was just quite interesting to look at the different strategies of the different teams, but. Bora Hansgrohe, when they came to the front in the last 10 kilometres, looked really, really impressive. And, and they've got a kind of mixed team of people to support Ackerman and also the likes of Micah and Formolo for the overall. You know, they've been on fire all season and, and they're riding really well again here. And as Semka said, they've got happy memories from the Giro with Lucas Postelberger a couple of years ago in Sam Bennett last year. Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's Seb PK, Race Radio at the Tour de France, interrupting our Giro coverage to remind me to tell you that this episode is sponsored by Lacquer. Now, Lacquer, it's a, a great idea, it seems to me. Um, it's basically community-driven insurance for cyclists. Cover your bikes, equipment, kit, up to the value you choose, basically. Richard, you're already a Lacquer customer, aren't you? I am, Lionel. No complaints as, as of yet. My new bike is insured with Lacquer. You've not had to make a claim yet, though. You've been, you've not, had, not suffered any misfortune. Touch wood. Touch wood, indeed. But one man who did have to make a claim is Lacca customer David. Hi, my name's David Drimple. I've been a Lacca customer since January this year, and I'm based in London. I heard about Lacca because they're involved in a lot of sponsorship of grassroots cycling teams in London. Kind of the model and the way the pricing structure works is what essentially attracted me to him in the first place. It's done so that the less people that claim per month impacts how much you pay. So you're given a maximum and an average price. Most often, since I've been a customer, I've paid less than the average. So essentially you set how much you want to cover your bikes for. So I know that if I need to claim for everything on the bike at once, that it will be covered up to that value. From the interactions I've had with Lacquer, it really feels like they understand the, the cyclist. Unfortunately, I, uh, I came off my bike a couple of weeks ago. I was kind of just riding to work. I damaged a few parts, kind of the saddle was a bit damaged and my shifters and stuff. And I started my claims process uh, but I hadn't actually got around to finishing it. I, I didn't think I had all the details. And Penny from Lacquer actually reached out to me over email asking if I needed any help uh, with the process. And I actually got back to her and said I was, oh, I was a little bit confused about this. From that moment, within 24 hours, I'd, had, uh, I'd been able to purchase the new parts and the money was already back in my account. Um, the way in which she kind of walked you through the process and the speed at which they responded and got everything in line was incredible. It was honestly... Quite an impressive process. Like I've uh, I've claimed before on insurance companies, and it's almost the amount of paperwork and hoops you need to jump through are almost overwhelming. Um, but they made it so so simple. So if you want to be like David and cover all your bikes and clothing and kit and equipment, you can get a ten pound credit by signing up today with the discount code podcast. So if you want to find out more about Lacquer, go to lacquer.co.uk. That's l-a-k-a.co.uk. So Max, we don't expect too much to happen on San Baronto today, but it's a mythical destination in Tuscan cycling, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
pretty special place for a lot of cyclists, uh, local cyclists. And uh, give me some names. Who, who are some of the guys that live there and trained on San Baronto? Uh, uh, Visconti lives on the top of San Baronto. Uh, the the team um, of uh, Visco is based right on San Baronto. Neri Sotoli, that's the oh, that's the, I just couldn't I couldn't remember. They keep changing name, KTM and now bikes. So basically, they're, they're they're based on the top. That's where the Visconti lives and the manager lives. And it's a uh, you know uh, it's, it's it's a great place. I mean, San Baronto is 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 the homeland of uh, of every Sunday rider, local rider. They do Vinci and they drop down San Baronto. They go up San Baronto and go down Lamporecchio. So it's. It's a very traffic, traffic bike traffic area. Um, and in the nineties, you had a you had a big group there, Ballerini, Taffy. That was kind of your home climb. Home point, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of guys lived around there. You know, just down the road, uh, Bartoli, Sorensen, Taffy's in Lamporecchio. You know, so Ballero on the other side. I lived there, Shinto, a lot of riders. So. In the nineties, yeah, I just had actually had an interview with an Italian guy, and I was just talking about how how many pros used to live in in the area in the days a few years ago, even back with the academy, and uh, how quiet it is right now with pros. It's still a great place, uh, and just going back to the day, a lot of stuff could happen if it rains. And uh, right now it's not raining, but I think it's going to rain in the afternoon. They they go down the steep side. What's the descent like? So it's a really fast descent. It's probably three k, three and a half k. Uh, nice roads. Uh, I'd say more technical descent uh, off of Castra, the Montalbano climb, the one before Vinci. That's going to be a pretty technical descent. Um, pretty straightforward descent, actually, Lamporecchio, and down and straight into Fuscheco. So Napalm, that was our friend Max Chiandri talking about San Baronto. Um, what was it like out there? The climb before it, the Montalbano, which is a third category climb, was probably hard, a lot harder and certainly more fans on it um, and probably more visually arresting. Um, where the San Baronto, which is, you know, this mecca for Tuscan cyclists, you know, couldn't really see what all the fuss was about. But it was, I suppose it was as we drove back down it. I know the race went up the slightly easier side today. Um, it, it's kind of tough for amateur cyclists. It's kind of... Richard, you said it's the box hill of Tuscany, and that's kind of what it is. It, the, maybe the other climb just that little bit too hard for the Sunday club run, and uh, whereas this one is a, a, a nice sort of um, Florentine steak that you can that's actually later. hope. Big with, juicy. We Florentine are. It's on. Steak. It's on my mind. The, the, the <laughs> San Baronto, though, it's. Um, I have a feeling that its fame and that the, the legend of San Baronto it was really born, as Max hinted at um, in that clip. Um, during this kind of heyday for Tuscan cyclists, I mean, Tuscan has always produced great riders, Gino Bartali and um, various other illustrious names. But in the 90s, there was a big group in particular with um, the guys that were mentioned there, Taffy, who we saw today at the finish. He was from Fuccecchio. Um, What's the even, point? Where's your visor? Do you know what? I've forgotten it. I've forgotten it. I'll wear it running tomorrow. <laughs> and Rolf Sorensen. So you know, everyone gravitated towards Tuscany. And, you know, we we pointed out Monte Serra earlier. Yeah, that was the, the famous sort of gym or, or testing ground used by the at one time infamous or certainly slightly controversial coach Luigi Cecchini. But people have, you know, I mean, times have changed. And, and Andorra and Girona and Nice are now the, the big hotspots for professional cyclists um, and and you know as Max said in that clip it's it's not quite what it was from that point of view. I certainly felt I remember a couple of years ago when uh, Giro went to Fausto Coppi country up in the northeast and we were both quiet in the car driving up a just a little lane and the sun was shining and you know it looked stunning and I think we both had the same thought at the same time which was it's strange to think that Fausto Coppi saw all of this in colour as well because we're so used to seeing the Fausto Coppi pictures in black and white. And I had a similar sort of feeling today, um, thinking that Gino Bartoli would have ridden up that climb in, you know, in the 30s and 40s. And that's one of the things about cycling, isn't it? As you say, you know, the, everywhere is a, a, a sort of a, you know, a testing ground or a battleground for past generations and future generations. Well, this is Gino Bartoli country here that we're in, isn't it? Um, how's Mike Shandry settling into Movistar? What's the point? Um, well, I think, Rich, I think, um, well, M Movistar is, is renowned. It's well known to be one of the more kind of, oh, I wouldn't say the looser teams, but one of the, 
the, the less sort of officious teams out there. In the last few years, we've seen the, the emergence of quite a few teams who take organisation very, very seriously. And I'm not saying that Movistar aren't organised, but there are teams like Sunweb and, and BMC, where Max Chandru was up until the end of the year, um, you know, where a lot of kind of information is exchanged hashtags. on emails and hashtags and this and that. And there are a lot of training camps. And a lot of, hang on, there are teams where a lot of information is exchanged <laughs> well, on emails. How, some of them, some of them have to use computers. How, how, tw- how 2019? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, and I think um, obviously I'd take a much, so a, much more, a much more refreshing kind of cavalier approach to these things. But, <laughs> I think that's, that's, quite, that's, a, not, that's, that's quite a quite I'm a good fit, really, Shandri and Movistar in that sense, and that's what that's what it's all about, isn't it? Finding an environment that suits suits you best. You probably will be pretty happy there. I mean, very a very manana type attitude in the team, <laughs> and well, I know he's a, he's relaxed, isn't he? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I remember Tuscans are relaxed. I, I know. I don't know. Look, I know we're not going to revive Lionel. Well, I think we're not going to revive Lionel Lenz Italian. <laughs> but Lionel, um, as your Italian improves over the next couple of weeks, you might start to notice this. The Tuscan accent is very languid, and it, it, it's kind of it's mirrored by their body language as well. They're kind of the well, we, we might get back to Super Superman Lopez here, but they're the kind of the Jamaicans of of Italy in some ways. <laughs> oh goodness me! We saw it. we we uh, had a close uh, shave with Superman today, <laughs> didn't we? At the finish, uh, I think you were about to launch into an anecdote there, Lionel. No, I felt well, there was a Shandri anecdote. Shandri. I mean, I just remember when BMC were here without a GC rider a few years ago, and you know they were supposed to be hunting for stages, but hadn't got in a break for a fortnight. And I and I was asking Max about you know how hard is it to um, you know get the riders to be self-motivated or is it up to the management to motivate them and he said oh it's up to the management to a certain extent and I said yeah, right. so what what did you say to them this morning I said just try to get in the break <laughs> before we talk about more cycling chats we should just um share with the listeners what we're drinking here what are we drinking this is a a wool top brewery shepherd's watch a rich dark ale that I'm drinking here I've got against the grain of course you have. Of course you have. Appropriate. Oh, wow. And I've got Hello Velo. Um, that's also appropriate, isn't it? And I notice on the back of the label here that um, the, these are, these beers are imported into Italy from Yorkshire. They so are. That's yeah. one link, wow. but there is an important reason why yeah. we're talking about this. Well, yeah, I mean, the, we, we'll give you more details about this later on, but we're doing an event during the World Championships in conjunction with the World Top Brewery in Yorkshire. It'll be a, a bike ride, uh, a buffet dinner, and uh, an event, a, a live cycling podcast, in effect. So that's on the Thursday of World Championship Week, and full details and tickets will go uh, become available during the Giro. So more details to follow, but really looking forward to that. If you want to get a heads up on when those tickets go on sale and how much it is and all of that, sign up to our newsletter. You can do that by going to thecyclingpodcast.com uh, and maybe we'll see you on the start line for an event we are calling the World Championship. Well, you are. Uh, and, and still on uh, on the subject of drinking vessels, uh, the mugs that Stacey Snyder, friend of the podcast, produced, limited edition mugs, uh, all sold out during stage one of the Giro, raising money for two very good causes, Right for Charlie and the Kelly Catlin Fund. We're delighted that they all sold out so quickly. Um, she produced 50 in the initial batch. She's going to do another batch, and they should be on sale in the final week of the Giro. We'll also be doing limited, limited edition mugs during the Tour de France and the Vuelta, all to raise money for good causes. Uh, so great news that they've they've sold out. Um, congratulations and thanks to everybody who bought one. And we'll give you details about the, the next batch as soon as they're available. The Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fuel by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. We've also got some great Science and Sport prizes and some Rafa swag as well. If you head over to Instagram... Yes, swag. That's what. Yeah, yeah, that's in, it, that, that it's in my word. script. Oh, it's right. in my okay, script okay. here. <laughs> uh, don't blame me. Blame Jonathan Rowe. Um, head over to Instagram to enter the competition. All, all you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> Blimey! Hang on. Blimey. This is the second in age age related insult I've had Sorry. today. You've asked what me also to to dub a reverberate <laughs> into. As you explained, he's quite old. 
fat shaming yesterday, ageism <laughs> oh, today. Goodness me. Goodness. Anyway, if you want some science to support goodies or Rafa swag, and head over to Instagram to enter the competition. All you need to do is follow the cycling podcast and share the latest episode via Spotify in an Instagram story. I mean, don't ask me what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you young kids out there, if you fancy winning some prizes, follow the cycling podcast and share the latest episode via Spotify in an Instagram story. I mean, if anyone manages to do that, they deserve a prize. <laughs> uh, well done. Um, before we crack on, guys, I've got a theory. I've got, oh, I've got a theory this here. Is, oh, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> it's about Egan Bernal. And yes. his broken and his in in very commas broken collarbone, right? Does he have? I mean, do we have? Do we have? I mean, it just crossed my mind. I've thought about this for a few days, thinking, what what if he's not actually injured, and and there was a sort of a reason or excuse invented for him to miss the Giro in order for him to go to the tour and try and win that. But of all the things you could invent, why would you invent a broken collarbone? I mean, there's a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not saying it's necessarily true. I'm just wondering. I'm just, just putting it out there. Do you mean it would be easier to say that than to say, oh, we've decided to change our team and yeah. go with, uh, yeah, we want Bernal for the tour? And well, we, 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 I mean, I mean this, this plan, assuming it's true, where did, did, what, was it concocted just by Bernal or... Or with the team. <laughs> Where your know. theory falls down is that it's a terrible theory. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he'd been out riding with Theo Gegenhart. He then, they went their separate ways. And in this half hour or so, mm. he was on his own. He managed to fall off and break his collarbone. What's collarbone. Your... When, when he crashed at San Sebastian last year, um, he, there were a lot of pictures posted on social media from hospital showing his recovery and his injuries and so on. Very little of that. Well, that's, that doesn't... And then the two pictures he has posted of him with his arm in a very suspicious-looking makeshift sling. They've been different arms both times. Well, apparently he was back on the bike this that, weekend. That was a, that was a joke. Oh. <laughs> 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 what's your... He's been back on the bike, though, this There's weekend, no basis for no, this there theory at all. It just Richard, crossed my mind. what's your view of the moon landings? Do you believe, <laughs> do you believe that, that man landed on the moon or... No, um, no. no. Is it all in the shadows in those photographs? <laughs> is it anyway? It's a, I mean, I do. There, there is an issue in cycling, though, with you know unexplained, you know, schedule changes and race program changes. And if you announce at the start of the year, oh, a man for the Giro is going to be Egan Bernal, and then you change your mind and go, actually, we think he can win the tour, the or we think is, he can. The fact is, at the start of the year, the Giro was a very important race for Team Sky in trying to find a, a new sponsor. It was going to mm, be a really important shop true. window. Then it ceased to be that, and it, there was definitely talk within the team i had this on good authority that there was talk of taking bernal out of the giro and putting him in the tour mm -hmm. and not... then Teo gagan hart and pa uh, pavel Siv sivakov rode so well at the tour of the alps i mean yeah i, I, I could, but i think ah, why, I see would, you're coming why, around. why would they have to why could they not no. just say we're just going to change our team selection for the two big stage races of the year well that's what you're going to go and ask dave brills for tomorrow morning <laughs> happily, final. happily. <laughs> oh, anyway um Sorry, Daniel, you going to say something? No, I was going to say something about feigning illness and injury, which is what you're alleging. Um, I remember the Belgian rider Mario Ertz, who was one of the big Belgian hopes of the early noughties. He, he told me once that um, he used to feel so much pressure, particularly in Ardennes week, that he would spend most of the race formulating an excuse that he would use in his interviews post-race, that he would, he would invent an ailment and he would spend you know all 200 kilometres of the race Thinking, oh no, I can't, I can't say the elbow. I said that last year. <laughs> and Luke, so on and so on. Look, I spoke to Matt White at the start this morning in Bologna. Um, his man Simon Yates obviously rode very well in the time trial, um, but he's been in the press as well because of his comments in the press conference, which backed up some remarks he'd made in Ruler magazine about just how confident he was going into this year and how he feels that he's the favourite. Um, Vincenzo Nibali responded to those comments. There's been a little bit of a, uh, you know, back and forth in the media on this. But I spoke to Matt White about the time trial and about about Yates and about Roglic. Let's hear what he said. Yesterday, then, uh, you surprised or pretty much what you expected from Roglic in particular? Not surprised at all. Uh, for me, he was always the always going to win yesterday. He's coming hot. Had two great TTs the week before, so no surprise with Roger. Maybe a little bit of surprise some of the gaps that he's taken on some guys, uh, especially Dumoulin. I don't think Tom would have been beaten by Roger ever by that much in a time trial, but uh, no surprise at all that he won. 
Simon, in his press conference the other day, very, very bullish, very confident. Is that something that you that you welcome? Well, he's the one who's got to deal with the media with that confidence, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> but it's, it's an uh, interesting one because guys are reluctant to speak like that because of the, the media. Does, yeah. it, does it just not bother him? No. No, no. And I think he's he is genuinely confident in his ability and as we are as a team. And uh, how he's handling that's that's his decision. But he's, uh, he knows he's had a very good preparation and he's, and he's just uh, he's, yeah, he's showing what he feels, which... Yeah, as you said before, not too many bike riders do, do they? No, I, I mean, you saw him, obviously, last year at the Giro and Annabelle to be in that, that spotlight. You know, mm. did he, did, was your observation that he copes with that really well? It doesn't really affect him. Uh, look, I think he's learnt. He's, he's a very different athlete than he was 12 months ago. Uh, it comes with experience. It comes with le- leading and winning other Grand Tours. So he's used to the, the rigmarole that he's got to deal with here, and uh, he's, he's definitely a lot more confident athlete than he was. But talking about that also... Will get his some of his rivals talking. I'm sure, or certainly, they'll notice him talking like that. Yeah. Do you, is that could that have a, an adverse effect, or is that again something that just doesn't bother him? It doesn't bother him. It's not, it's not like I don't think he's being disrespectful to anybody as well. He, he, so, our rivals are our rivals, and that's not going to change. And do you look at Roglic in the position he's in now, albeit very early, and think you know it could be similar to last year where you were in that position very early on and. You get the sense that Roglic is really on fire, and the question will probably be: Can he maintain it all the way through? Yeah, well, that's that's going to be the million-dollar question. I think in modern cycling, no one's no one's won Romandie and gone on to win the Giro. Doesn't mean it won't happen, can't happen this year. But there's there's been a pattern of how people have prepared for the Giro. I know cycling's changing, but uh, it's a, it's an interesting one. And just generally, this year Adam's been really on, on fire. Simon looks like somebody who's been very sure about the journey that he's been on he's not gone into stage races trying to win them he looks like he's been having a bit of fun is that is that the way that he's been using races 100 percent. he's since last year since we made the, since we decided on the tiger would be the giro everything was building to be in top form here for the month of may and anything before was just ticking boxes get some race racing in the legs and, and try to improve on certain areas like his time trolling and just getting getting some rhythm back but yeah he there was last year. The goal was to try to win Paris. The last year, the goal was to try to win a stage in Catalonia. This year, the goals were we were ready for here and nothing really before. So anything before was just a bonus. Brilliant. So that was Matt White there with, with his own interesting theory, um, not as interesting as mine, but um, the, the the Tour de Romandie. No, no one's. It's not a theory. It's a fact that no rider has won the Tour de Romandie and gone on and won, won the Giro. Um, is this, you're looking is this, skeptical. Is this one of these things that someone's going to check and they're going to realise that the last, I hope time, no one checks the last it. time someone did it was 1996? I hope no one Someone che- did it before that in 1994. Well, okay, the, let's let's assume that it's correct. <laughs> and the point being that it's a long time to maintain that sort of form uh, from you know the raw It Effectively, means being on that level for five weeks. Yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, it's the risk, isn't it? But from just from listening to Laurence de Plus yesterday and and reading what Jumbo Visma have said in some of the press today, this is part of the plan. They're quite happy to have the jersey now and they're quite happy to race the full three weeks um, with the jersey if necessary. I think Roglic wants to get on with it because his um, his wife is due to have a baby on the last day of the Giro. So he's, he's hoping to win. Wow, uh, interesting. He's hoping to get it in the bag before before the race reaches Verona, I think. Well, uh, well, that's a nice opportunity to mention Kilometre Zero, which launches tomorrow, Monday morning, sponsored this year by Handscrower. Daniel, your first episode is about Bologna, yeah. uh, the fat one. And uh, episode two or maybe three, not quite sure on the order yet, will be about fatherhood and fathers who are racing at the Giro d'Italia. This is because Connor Dunn... And his partner, Stacey Kelly, had a baby, uh, I think, nine days before, nine or ten days before the Giro started. So um, he's I mean, here absolutely for... Absolutely perfect timing <laughs> by Conor Dunna. I think he's he's played a blinder there, hasn't he? Roglic has got it all wrong. Going home, three weeks racing your legs to, to that. <laughs> to that. Poor old Roglic. Yeah, Roglic is still in the pink jersey, isn't he? Um, still, there was still a lot of talk, obviously, today about the, his performance yesterday. The time trial in general yesterday, people still wondering what had happened with Tom Dumoulin, how come um, he hadn't got closer to Roglic. I spoke to Tom Dumoulin after the finish tonight in Fuchekio, and the voice you'll hear after his is that of his direct supportive, Michael Elijan. Um, 
Dutch pronunciation, a bit ropey. Um, but also talking about the the time trial to the top of the San Luca climb. Yeah, it's always stressful. <laughs> But uh, we did really well today as a team and uh, it also gives me a lot of confidence for, for the next week that we can pull it off even in stressful situations. It was quite hectic going into climbs today and going into downhills and we were always first positions of the bunch so yeah, it was good. You've had a few hours where you've had a day to reflect on yesterday. Um, what's the conclusion 24 hours on? Is it that just Roglic was supersonic yesterday? Oh, that is definitely a conclusion, but uh, speaking for my own ride, I think I just, just didn't have that that real kick, that real, uh, you, have to, you have to be able to get yourself to places that you don't want to go, actually, and uh, I wasn't able to, I, was, I had a solid ride, I was, I, was, uh, I was feeling good, I was feeling nice, and but it was just not... You don't win a prologue with uh, feeling nice and feeling good. You win a prologue by suffering, like, yeah, to depths that you cannot believe, and uh, yeah, that that wasn't possible for me. So, just what was the kind of debrief last night um, from from Tom's time trial? What was the the overall verdict? Yeah, did he maybe started a little bit too slow in the in the first part of the of the time trial, the uh, the flat part? Um, but overall, yeah, he had a good feeling uh, on the time trial, also on the climb. Um, yeah, the Roglic was outstanding, but the other three uh, in front of him uh, are a little bit similar in time. So, yeah, at the end, uh, we are satisfied with with the result. Uh, you ho always hope for more, but it's it, it is what it is. Eh? And the fact that he went first of all of the favourites, I mean, he had no reference points whatsoever. No. Did, did that affect him? And was that a reason maybe to put him off a little bit later? No, we just made um, the goal the goal to uh, put him uh, to put him first uh, of the team. And at the end, at the, at the drawing, we were also the first team. So that was a little bit of coincidence that we, he, was, uh, he was the first of the whole pack. Um, that was also his own choice. We we discussed it if which place he wanted to start. So uh, yeah, at the end we couldn't do much about uh, him being the first one to start. Um, and I think all the other favourites also started in the in the first uh, block, apart from uh, apart from Simon Yates. So I think yeah, the choice that we made was a good one. And also Dom is still behind it. So yeah. And just out of curiosity, when you're thinking, you know, which order your riders go in. And was it a consideration yesterday that if he had the best time, he would have to sit in the hot seat for three hours up there? Yeah, there was a consideration also. That's maybe a disadvantage. On the other hand, yeah, yeah, we saw also with Roglic that he also had to do it. And I mean, if it was uh, really cold and raining, it was a bigger problem than it was now, I think. So, uh, yeah. And on the other hand, it's also an advantage if you have to sit for three and a half hours in a hot seat. That means that you're winning. So, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's either either way, it's uh, yeah choices that you have to make. And I think still we we made a good choice by getting them uh, first in the start. Yeah. So, chaps, that was the well, the, the Sunweb crew about yesterday's time trial. So it doesn't sound as though they're too alarmed. Interesting point about the lack of reference points that Dumoulin had yesterday and he, him saying that he, he just didn't really feel like hurting himself. And I suppose, you know, the two things may be linked. I, I mean, mean they, you, they did choose to put him off first. You're not going to have many reference no, but points, they, are you? But, but mm. then what they didn't know, actually we should check this and what order the two things come in. Um, they, or they didn't realise that they were going to have the first rider. They wanted Dumoulin to go in the first tranche, but they uh, didn't realise that they were going to be the first off. It was, I think it caught a few people out. One guy who it did certainly catch out the time trial yesterday was the Japanese rider Hiroki Nishimura, who has already, well, he's already gone home. The, the Nippo Fantini rider, Nippo Vini Fantini rider, um, was outside the time limit yesterday wasn't it quite a sad story really for a guy um you know running Giro a huge thing for him and and for Japanese cycling in general and everything that Nippo Fantini um are trying to do with Japanese cycling I spoke to the team manager this morning Francesco Pelosi about 
uh, <laughs> Nishimura. Lots of, um, Francesco, obviously we saw what happened to Hiroki yesterday. I mean, how much of a surprise was that and how much of a disappointment and how upset was he? So Hiroki is a young guy that paid uh, a lot of attention for the event. Uh, for sure, with our uh, team manager, Japanese, uh, uh, we decided to bring him uh, here for a big experience for a young rider. But he paid uh, too much attention. He, he had a bad night uh, and you during all the hours before the race was too much excited and emotionate about that and they paid that. And Francesco, you're an Italo-Japanese team and you've been, well, this project has been going on for a few years now. I know you've got a long-term project, but what is the, the one kind of obstacle or the one thing that the Japanese riders need to improve in to, for you to move to the next level with, with those riders? Uh, for Japanese, we, we need more time. Uh, our project uh, is at the uh, fifth year and now uh, we are developing the project for the next five years. Even if the reform of UCI is difficult because um, it's not clear the rules and with Japanese you, in particular you need to explain the rules before the request uh, and uh, for sure we want to continue the project to uh, increase the quality of Japanese riders and um, uh, moreover, uh, have this team is important to uh, increase the number of funnel of number of person in Japan, young guy that uh, choose uh, cycling and not other sport. So there is a lot of things to do. Yeah, he was 4:36 down on Roglic. I mean, that was quite conclusively outside the time limit. Um, and uh, well, for those who are wondering, stage one yesterday was eight kilometers long, so it couldn't be a prologue had to be stage one. Um, would he have been allowed to, would there have been a time limit if it had been a prologue? Because I know that if it's a prologue and you crash and don't finish, you can still resume the race with stage one. Whereas if it's stage one, mm. you are out of the race. I don't, would the time limit have applied if it had been a prologue? Not sure. No, Not sure. No the, I mean, it was, a, it was a big call. I think um, it was a big call for Francesco, who we heard from there, to take Nishimura to, to the race. But of course, of course, they're you know they're trying to develop Japanese cyclists. I think that the director sportifs didn't necessarily agree. They didn't think he was ready, and then you know the pressure just got to him. And Francesco just said that he felt as though he had the weight of Japan on his shoulders. And lastly, just on the time trial yesterday and the way it all played out with all the favourites, bar Simon Yates going in that first half hour. Quite a lot of people on our Facebook group and people on social media in general saying it was you know it kind of. It did fade away into, uh, you know, it was like a firework that didn't really go off. And if anyone was tuning into the Giro's opening time trial thinking, well, I just watched the last hour, see all the big guns go off and hadn't realised that they were all going off early, would have would not really have had a great deal to watch. And it was, from a sporting point of view, although it looked fantastic and the course was brilliant, from a sporting point of view, um, it was a bit unfortunate for the race, really, especially as the expected bad weather didn't materialise. And it just makes me wonder, we talked, to Scott Sunderland about this as we were going back to our car um, after the uh, in order to go up to the climb yesterday and he said oh you can't change it so that you know the, the race organisers impose the order on the teams you've got to give the teams the leeway to make tactical decisions um, and I can see that point but yesterday it kind of backfired a little uh, bit maybe yeah. a random draw you, you decide the order of the teams and then at the team presentation you could have a random draw assigning the riders a slot on the um, time trial start list that might sort of add a bit of razzmatazz to the team presentation I remember that ever happening before, but it was it did make the day a bit of a, a damp squib, unfortunately, uh, and it and it shouldn't have been because it felt amazing. We spoke to some uh, friends of the podcast this morning in Bologna who'd been there and, and felt the same that it had fallen a little bit flat after the initial half hour of frenzied excitement, and that that's a shame because it's the build up is all is. The build up is what's it's watching watching cycling is all about. It's all about anticipation. So it, I think it was a bit disappointing. Anyway, the Giro's underway. We're underway. This will be my last podcast for a bit, I think, unless I appear a little bit tomorrow because I'm off tomorrow back to London and I come back in next week. It'll be Lionel and Daniel for a bit and we're doing a bit of a... We're doing it in shifts, aren't mm, we? Although yeah. Daniel's here the whole time. Yeah. Um, so... We'll try uh, not to south. break it. We'll try not to break tomorrow. it, Rich. It's in good hands. It's in good hands. Another Relax. sprint tomorrow, chaps. By the sea. We'll get cheer on tomorrow. We'll Giro, celebrate... Giro's desperate to come on. We'll celebrate the Giro's first trip to the coast of 
of 2019. What more appropriate way to do so than have Chiro on? Perfect. So, should we go and have our Florentine steak? Let's do that. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, James. Just before we go, finally, a big thanks to some of the friends of the podcast who signed up. These people signed up on the, the day that the Friends of the Podcast scheme opened way back in December uh, last year. So a big thank you to Alistair Alexander, Patrick Mannon, Andrew Canning, Derek Adams and Liam Brothwood. Thank you to Paul Fraser, John Rayner, Timothy Scott Ellis, Andrew Rigby and James Phillips. And thank you to Robert Hill, Philip Everett, George Christensen, Zuko Nonsuba, and thank you to Vashni Skipper. <laughs>